I lost my tie during the during the baptism. It fell down and got soaking wet. And I said, well, no tie today. So, uh, so if y'all okay with that, if you're not, well, then you just have to get over it and we'll just figure it out, okay? All right. We're going to do the announcements at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the message today, uh, as well as handing out our certificates to the baptism, those who got baptized today. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 24. Uh, I thought, what a, what a great day to talk about forgiveness. How many of y'all struggle with forgiveness? I'll tell you, let's be honest this morning. I know there ain't hardly but one or two hands went up, but we all know today we struggle with it. We struggle with forgiveness um, I found a story, and I just want to read it to you as you're, or tell it to you as you're flipping there. First Samuel 24. We're just going to read. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. We're just going to read the first uh, four verses there, verses one through four. But the Bible talking about forgiveness today, and this story kind of relates to it. It's talking about two ladies. Uh, they were in Nazi occup- uh, uh, Nazi camps, uh, concentration camps, and. Um, she was there uh, giving, a, giving a Bible study, and there was all types of people there. And one of the people that were there was one of the men who worked in the, in the concentration camp. He was one of the soldiers. She recognized him. And the whole message, she was saying, when we confess our sins, God casts them into the deepest ocean, and they're gone forever if we confess our sins. That was the message she delivered that day. And so as she was standing there and she was delivering the message and then the gentleman got up out of his seat and as he got up, she recognized who he was. She recognized and the, the, the emotions came flooding back to her. The emotions of being humiliated, the emotions of, of being beaten, the emotions of being hurt just, just come thrusting back into her heart. And as he got closer to her, he reached out his hand and he said, fine message. How good it is to know that if you can say that our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And he stuck his hand out and he said, will you forgive me? You see, he remembered her out of all of those people. And in this story, she says that she knew and she heard that forgiveness was a commandment of God. And you see, that's how we see forgiveness in our life. We see it as a commandment of God, but we don't see it as a daily exercise. We see it as something that God says, well, he will forgive us of our sins, of our wickedness, of our wrongdoing. And we say, praise God. And we ask him often, Father, forgive me for I have sinned. We pray that prayer daily. We pray it in the morning. We pray it at night. We ask God to forgive us. We pray, as Paul says, we pray without ceasing throughout the day for God to forgive us. But as she said, I only knew it as a commandment. But I need to do it as an exercise. So she says as she was clutching her heart, as her hand was in her pocketbook, she had no desire. And she said, Jesus, help me. And she stretched out her hand. And she said the Spirit of God came over her. And she felt it from her heart to her shoulder to her arm, all the way to the hand of the gentleman that was standing in front of her. And she says, I forgive you with all my heart. And she said they stood there and just hugged and cried and hugged because there was true forgiveness. There was true forgiveness in her heart and his. You see, this morning is true forgiveness in your heart today. You see, we say forgiveness, well, I forgive you. And then you go home and man, those emotions come flooding back and man, forgiveness is not anywhere near your heart. You may be even thinking about all of the things and they're just stewing. But I thought, man, what a great day to talk about forgiveness. Seven people came and rippled the waters of a baptismal pool. And that happened because of forgiveness this morning. Understand that. That happened because of forgiveness. It was because of the forgiveness of Jesus of the sins of those seven that got baptized today. That's what that is. See, this morning, forgiveness is an amazing thing that God blesses us 
But let me ask you today, how do you expect God to forgive you when you're not willing to forgive others? How do you expect God to move in your life to answer your prayers if we're not willing to forgive others? You see, the passage this, this morning is in 1 Samuel 24. We're going to read verses 1 through 4. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word. 1 Samuel 24, verses 1 through 4. The words are on the screen there. If you didn't bring your Bible, but I hope you did, you knew you were coming to church. <clears throat> the Bible says in verse 1, And it came to pass, when Saul was returned from following the Philistines, that it was told him, saying, David is in the wilderness of Enged. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. And he came to the sheep coats by the way where was a cave, and Saul went in to cover his feet. And David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy unto thy hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privately. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. If you would pray with me. Father God, we thank you, Lord, that we can come into your house today. God, again, we give you praise. Father, we, God, we can't say thank you enough, Lord, for what you're doing right here in White Plains. God, we can't say enough, Lord, for seeing those waters moving, God. And Lord, what a blessing it is to fill that pool up as, as, uh, as much as we can, Lord. And God, I pray the only person that would get the praise, the glory for it today would be you. Father, we're here today, God, because your son died on the cross of Calvary for us, Lord. And we're here, God, just to praise your holy name. God, I ask, Lord, today, if there's one here, Father, that's maybe their heart is on fertile ground. Lord, maybe something's going on in their life. Lord, maybe today is that day, Lord, that they never trusted in you. God, today is the day of salvation. Lord, may they come to know you. God, we thank you, Lord, for, for all the folks that are here this morning. We pray for those who weren't able to make it. God, would you minister unto them in a way that only you can. And we thank you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated this morning. Thank you for standing with me. So three things I want to talk about this morning, and the first one being convenience. Convenience, conviction, and confession. The first one being convenience. Now, this is a little odd of a story. How many of y'all have ever read this story before? Anybody in here? Few people have. It's an odd story if you've already read it. It's interesting how how David and Saul met in this cave, all right? It's kind of a personal story about how David and Saul met in this cave. Now, to, in today's world, when we're traveling and we're on the interstate, there's something called rest areas, rest stops, right? You can go if you're thirsty, if you need to reuse the restroom, whatever you need to do, you need to stretch your legs. Well, they're called, they're called rest areas now. You see, they didn't have rest areas back then. So they would travel and travel. Well, the scripture says that Saul took 3,000 chosen men. That's important. He took 3,000 chosen men out of all of Israel. In other words, the best of the best. I mean, this was a Navy SEALs type of group that Saul picked up, right? So he had, he had the, the best of the best. It says, and they went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats and he came to the sheep coats by the way. Now, this is where David, if you were here last Sunday, you remember. If not, I'll give you a crash course. So last Sunday, we talked about David hiding in a cave because he was fearing for his life. He was ready to just die. And God brought David his brothers. God brought David his dad. God brought David 400 men that, as the scripture says in 22 verse 2, it says that they had been in debt, they were in distress, they were discontented, they were gathered themselves together. God brought David 400 soldiers. They just hadn't been trained yet. So David had his family. He had 400 men. Now him and David, they were all in this cave in the back of the cave. Now here comes Saul coming in as the Bible says, it says, and he came into the, uh, into the sheep coats by the way. And then it says, um, 
And then it says there was a where was a cave and Saul went in to cover his feet. Now we're going to be really brief. That means he was using the bathroom, okay? If you read in the Bible where it says he's covered his feet, he wasn't taking a nap, he wasn't trying to get cozy, my man was using the restroom. He was at the rest area there in the area, in the land, okay? Everybody good with that? Let's move past it. We all laughed. We know what it is. Right? Let's, let's move past it. So he was using the restroom. The Bible says, and David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. Now here is the convenience. The convenience is God brought Saul to David. Now, anybody in their right mind, again, remember, these 400 men were running from Saul just like David was. He was run, they were running from Saul because they had been ridiculed, they'd been tortured, they'd been uh, just pushed on with uh, the, the, the distress of debt. So they were all been afflicted by King Saul, and here he comes in, and all these 400 men, man, they were chomping at the bit. They're like, there he is. He's got his back to us. He's preoccupied. They said, David, just go kill him. Take care of it. Just take care. The convenience was there. Now, do y'all have friends that are bad influences? Some of y'all's friends might be in the room that are bad influences, so you don't want to say nothing, right? Sometimes you got those friends that, that help you, but then sometimes you got those friends that urge you on that say, just do it, just do it. It's fine, just do it, you know? We all have those friends. Well, you see, these, these friends that David had made, these new acquaintances, well, they said in verse 4, they said, Behold, the day of which the Lord hath said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy unto thy hand, that thou mayest do unto him as you as shall seem good unto thee. He said, David, he's right here, brother. Take him out. End this thing, and you will be king. Just end it. The Bible says that David didn't go and kill him, but instead he, he went. You see, when, uh, when people would wear robes, and this is through studies and different things, when people would wear robes and they would be doing what Saul was doing, they would take the robes off and they would lay them to the side. So it wasn't that Saul was wearing the robe and David come behind him with a knife and just sliced it off. It was he was wearing the robe and he laid it to the side. So David kind of snuck over to where the robe was. He cut a corner of the tassel off of the bottom of his robe. And so therefore he, was, uh, therefore he was there and he cut it off. But he knew instantly that he shouldn't have done it. You say, well, why should he not have done it? Well, there's several reasons why, but let's talk about the main one. You see, in the, in the military... People are taught you don't salute the person, you salute the rank. You salute the rank. So if there is an individual that is a captain or lieutenant or lieutenant commander, general, whatever he is, he's outranking you even though he may not be acting as though he should, he still holds the rank. So when they walk by you, you salute the rank. You see, in David's mind, as there was that convenience that this happened, now listen to what he says in verse 5. He says, and it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him. This is the same words that were used when David counted the nation of Israel and God told him not to. You see, he was wanting to see how many folks that were there. He was wanting to take a census like we do today still. He was wanting to take a census and God told him no. So when he did, as soon as he did, instantly conviction fell upon his heart. Have you ever had that happen to you before? God told you not to do something. And as soon as you did it, as soon as the words were out of your mouth, you said, what have I done? Shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't even have been here, but I listened to me and not to God. It was instant regret. There was instant conviction in your heart. And David was heart was convicted right off the bat. He said to his men, he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed to stretch forth mine hand against him, seeing, listen, he is the anointed of the Lord. Was Saul acting as though a king should act? No way. Not even close. 
But it wasn't who Saul was. It was who put Saul in that position. You see, God anointed Saul. That was his man. Was he doing right? No, but he was still God's man. He was still chosen by God. So therefore, David had a respect for him, but more importantly, he had a respect for God. And because he had a respect for God, he had a respect for Saul because he was honoring who he anointed. You see this morning, if we have a love for the Lord, we will automatically have a love for everybody else. We'll automatically have a love for everybody else because God loves the world. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. So if we have a true anointed love for God, we should have a true anointed love for everybody. You say, Michael, you don't understand what that person done. It doesn't matter what that person done. It's because God created them. He made them in his likeness, in his image, and he loves them. So therefore we do not as Christians have an option, but to love them. Now we may not like their sin. God does not like their sin and that's fine. We don't have to condone what they do, but as a person, we still have to love them. As a person, we still have to respect them. So David was saying he was respecting the rank. He was respecting the person. And he said, we can't do this. He is God's anointed. Now, can you imagine this conversation taking place? I see these pictures in my head when I'm studying and reading. David and 400 men plus his family, they were all in the back of this cave. And here's Saul in the top corner just doing his business and all this is going on. The Bible says that Saul, he rose up. He got out of the cave in verse 7. He rose up and he left the cave. So what did, what did David do? He could have just stood there. See, that's what we do. When we get convicted about something, we just say, oh, I knew I shouldn't have done that. And we leave it at that. We say something against somebody that we shouldn't have said. And we say, man, I should have never said that. But is that what the Bible says to do? To just say, I should have never said that. I should have never been there. I should have never done that. The Bible says to go and ask forgiveness. The Bible says to clear the air. The Bible says to, to build that relationship back up, mend that relationship. So what, did, what does David do? You see, there was convenience because they were in the cave, but man, then there was conviction. Then there was conviction. Look what, look what he says in verse 8. The Bible says that David also arose afterward and went out of the cave. Remember how many men Saul had with him? 3,000. What kind of men did he have? Chosen men, the best of the best. These were militant guys. They were ready to not only fight, but they were ready to kill David. That's why Saul brought them together. So David put himself in, in such, a, uh, such a fragile state. He laid everything on the line. He was, he was in a fragile state. He comes running out of the cave and he cried after Saul saying, my Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David was stooping to his face to the ground and he bowed himself. He was so vulnerable. He didn't just come out of the cave surrounded by men. The Bible says that he came out of the cave. He bowed to the ground. He put his face to the ground. He couldn't see anybody coming. He couldn't see the enemy coming. But you see today, he didn't have a fear of the enemy. He didn't have a fear of the 3,000. He didn't have a fear of Saul. He had a fear of the Lord. You see, our fear is in the wrong direction today. We have a fear of what this person will think or what that person will think. Man, I wonder how many people don't walk down an aisle when God says, it's your time to be saved. You need to leave that lifestyle. You need, to, you need to commit your heart and life to me. But they don't. People don't walk down the aisle because they're afraid. They fear what somebody else may think. Doesn't matter what somebody. Our fear's in the wrong direction this morning. You see, David didn't fear Saul. He didn't fear the army. He didn't fear. He feared the Lord. The Bible says that he went to the cave and he said, or he went out of the cave and he says, my Lord, talking about uh, Saul, lowercase l, he says, my Lord, the king. And when David looked behind him, David was, or when Saul looked behind him, David was stooped his face to the earth and he bowed himself. Listen to what he says. And David said to Saul, wherefore hearest thou men's words saying, behold, David seeketh thy hurt. 
He's saying, why are you listening to them? You see, that's what we ought to do this morning. I would imagine that the majority of conversations, or not conversations, the majority of disputes happen simply because of miscommunication. They simply happen maybe because somebody told something that wasn't true. Maybe they knew a part of the story and the part that they didn't know, what did they do? Well, they make it up. They know part of it, but they don't know the rest, so they just make up the rest. So now all of a sudden, these per this person is mad at another person, and it has nothing to do with the truth. It has nothing to do with the reason. It's all miscommunication. It's all told on lies. So David is coming, and he is confronting He's confronting Saul because he is convicted. Now, how often do we do that? Well, nobody wants to have hard conversations, do we? Nobody wants to go to a person and say, listen, we need to figure this out. That's just not a fun thing to do. You would rather just stew in anger and upset and be mad, believe in a lie, and not ever talk to that person than just say, let's figure this thing out. This morning, I'm not talking to the people that are, that, are, that are lost, not in church. I'm talking to me and you this morning. I'm talking to the ones that came on a Sunday morning to church that still have a problem with forgiveness. But at the drop of a hat, expect God to forgive us. So he continues. He continues with his conviction. He continues with his, with his speech. He says in verse 11, Moreover, my father, see, ye the, uh, see the skirt of thy robe in thy hand, for in that I cut off the skirt of thy robe and killed thee not. You see, he's holding it in his hand. He said, I could have taken you out, Saul. <clears throat> I could have killed you. I could have taken you out. But he said, I didn't. Listen, he says, and I have not sinned against thee, yet thou huntest my soul to take it. He says, I didn't do anything wrong. And here's the proof. Two times during this speech, so to speak, that David was giving to Saul, he says this, and this is where it lies at. This morning. Y'all listen to me. Verse 12 and verse 15, he says this The Lord judge. The Lord therefore judge. David has taken it out of his hands, he's taken it out of Saul's hands. We need to stop carrying the gavel in our hand because we don't deserve to have it in our hand. You see, we're casting judgment. We're casting punishment. We're casting uh, the, being the, the judges of all people saying he deserves this or she deserves that or they don't deserve this or they deserve that when you don't know. Amen? We don't know. You don't know what they're going through. Nobody knows what you're going through except for the closest people in your family. Stop hitting that gavel when you don't deserve to hold it. There is one judge, one righteous judge, and that's the Father, and it's not us. He says, the Lord therefore judge. And if you have the, the courage, if you have the faith to say, let God judge between me and you, I would imagine you're going to be the one that's probably in the right. But sometimes it doesn't matter who's right and who's wrong. Sometimes it's just better just to mend the relationship and move past it. Move past who's right and who's wrong. And say, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. We're on the same team. We serve the same Lord. And praise God for it. He says, the Lord judge, the Lord judge. And so what happens when he's saying all of these things? Verse 17, the Bible says, he said to David, man, Saul lifted up his voice. Listen, look, look what it says at the end of verse 16. Saul lifted up his voice and what? He wept. Man, he was crying. He was weeping because the conviction that was, on the Holy, that was from the Holy Spirit of God on David was now upon Saul. He knew he was in the wrong. He knew what he was doing wasn't right. Listen, there was, we saw the convenience, we saw the conviction, but then there's confession. Listen, he says in verse 17, he says to David, thou art more, thou art more righteous than I, for thou hast rewarded me good, whereas I have rewarded thee with evil. You see, there's confession. He said, I'm wrong. 
I'm wrong. Now that's a tough thing to do, right? To say you're wrong. Or that's an easy thing to say, isn't it? <laughs> to say I'm wrong, that's a tough thing to say. To say that's I listened to the wrong person. I done the wrong thing. I said the wrong thing. It's me. I'm wrong. He says, You're more righteous than I am. He says, And thou hast showed showed this day how thou shalt how thou hast dealt with me for as much as when the Lord hath delivered me into thy hand, thou killest me not. Listen, he says, for if a man find his enemy, will he let him go away? Wherefore the Lord reward thee, reward thee good for thou hast done unto me this day. Now here's the moment. This is when Saul says it. He says, and now behold, I know well that thou shalt surely be king. And that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in thine hand. Saul said, you're the one. You're the right king. You see, I, I heard this recently, how when Saul, was, uh, when Saul was anointed king, the oil was put in a jar and it was poured over his head. A man-made jar. Because it was in that moment that they wanted a king. They wanted a person. So God gave them what they wanted. Do you know sometimes God gives you what you want even though it's not what you need? Does that make sense? Sometimes God gives you what you want even though it's not what you need. But you see, Saul was anointed. The oil that Saul had was anointed out of a jar. You remember what David was anointed out of? A ram's horn. You see, it was something that God made. God didn't make that jar, but God did make that ram's horn. You see, because God chose David. That was God's will. That was the person to take the throne of Israel. And as he was, as Saul was crying out to him, as Saul was crying out to him, David, uh, David heard Saul give, Saul gave a request, swear now therefore unto me by, my, by the Lord that thou will not cut off my seed after me. You know, David could have said, you, you've been chasing me for a year. I'm not doing any, but David didn't. You see, that's judging. That's holding those grudges. The church, you can raise your hand or keep your hand down. But man, we hold grudges. We hold grudges. We refuse to forgive others, even though God has forgiven us over and over and over again. Daily, daily God forgives us. David said, David swear unto Saul, and Saul went home. You see, he said, I, I'm, I'm, I won't do it. I'm not going to do that. You see, some people may look at this text. They may look at this passage and say, well, Michael, that's not real life. If I go to that person right now that's done all these things against me and I say, please forgive me, more, than more times than not, they're not going to forgive me. Truly forgive me, they're not going to care. See, this is not real life, but it is. You know why? Because you read this passage in chapter 24, and Saul says, man, I forgive you. I forgive you. All is good. All is good. But then when you flip over to chapter 26, that Saul's at it again. Saul's at it again. He's, he's doing the same thing. He's trying to kill David again in chapter 26. You see, there's a, a phrase that, that people say, um, mostly the, the, the old timers say, what is it? Uh, I've, I've rehearsed it all week long. Um, oh my, fool me, there you go, somebody said it. Fool me once, thank you Trish. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. That is such an unbiblical statement. There's no forgiveness in that statement. You see, you're saying, I'll forgive you once, but man, you do it twice, I'm cutting you off. That's basically what you're saying. In the most Christian way, that's what you're saying. See, I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to read this quick. I'm not going to read it, but just kind of go over it real quick. You see, Saul arose against David again. And man, God, God put David, or excuse me, God put Saul and his armor bearer in a deep sleep to the point to where David walked all the way up to Saul and he had his spear shoved into the ground. And David and his leader were standing there, his sergeant, his second in command was standing right beside of him. And man, he even says, 
He says in verse 8, God hath delivered thine enemy unto thy hand this day. Now, therefore, let me smite him, I pray thee, with the spear even to the earth at once. Man, he was wanting to drive that spear straight through him into the ground. He said, let me do it, David. Let me do it. Because he had already forgiven once, and now he's at it again. You see, you might have people in your life today, you've forgiven them once, and they're at it again. Same old person, same old things, same old problems. See, David had the same issue with Saul. The Bible says that David took his spear. He took his spear and he took his water and he went across. He went across the field and he yelled out to him. And it was Saul realized once again that, man, I'm, I'm in the wrong. But it wasn't shortly after that that Saul died in battle. Him and Jonathan, his brother, which was David's best friend in all the world, is what the scripture says. You see, today, I'm telling you all to tell you this. Matthew 18, 21 and 22, Jesus was asked how many times that we should forgive people. One of his disciples, I think it was Peter, maybe it was John, I can't remember 100%. But they asked him and they said, well, seven times, right? I forgive somebody seven times. And Jesus said, 70 times seven. In other words, you just keep doing it. You just keep loving them. Because one day... One day they're going to listen to the Holy Spirit of God and they're going to know where God's love is. It's going to be in your heart. You say, well, I just can't do that. That's just not me. You don't know, blah, 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 blah. That's what we say. You just don't know. I'm going to close with this text. 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. It says, if a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? We say we love God. But then those people that are so close to us that we see day in and day out, we refuse to love them. Church, you may not agree with that verse, but it's not that you're not agreeing with me, you're not agreeing with God. If we hate our brother... We're lying in our faith. You see, today is a day of forgiveness. Today is a day of salvation. Some of you this morning, man, you may have some hard hearts because of something that's happened in your life, in your family, in your workplace, in the church. I don't know. You got to let it go. You got to let it go because the more room, and y'all listen to me, the more room unforgiveness takes up in your heart, the more room bitterness takes up in your heart, that's the less room that Jesus can take up in your heart. You got to let it go. You got to ask for forgiveness to the Lord. And you need to ask forgiveness to whoever your brother or sister or person is in your life that, that, that's holding you. You know, I heard said not too long ago that when you hold a grudge, the only person you're hurting is you. Because more times than not, the person you holding a grudge toward don't even know. If you're here this morning and you need forgiveness from the Lord, you need to ask him to come into your life. Man, today is the best day to do it. Man, we, we still got the pool up. My shirt's still wet. Let's just go on and do it, right? God's calling you to be saved this morning. Today is the day of salvation. If you would stand with me this morning, Brother Clint, if you would come and just play something softly, stand with me this morning. I'm going to pray for you right now is the time. You say, Michael, I can ask. I can pray later. Michael, I can talk to that person later. I can do this later. No, don't do it later. We don't have later. Church, we got right now. We have right now. Let's ask God to do a work in our heart, okay? Let me pray for you. If God's working in your heart, if God's calling you, today is the day.